The United States has long been seen as a leader in military power, but times are changing. Countries like China and Russia are stepping up and competing for the top spot in advanced military technology. In response, the U.S. has unveiled a new combat drone that can take off from an aircraft carrier, an impressive leap in military innovation. How will this game-changing technology shape the future of naval and air warfare? Will it strengthen U.S. dominance or spark a global arms race? Join us as we delve into the capabilities of the massive combat drone that the United States recently launched from its aircraft carrier in the middle of the ocean. The future of warfare has been up in the air for a long time as different top countries try to topple one another with superior technology. Aerial warfare has been debated for quite a while, undergoing various transformations and developments over the years. During the 1930s, the British Royal Air Force trained to use anti-aircraft weaponry using the radio-controlled DH-82 Tiger Moth target drones created by de Havilland Aircraft. De Havilland Aircraft, a British company specializing in creating aircraft weapons for the country's defense, created these target drones as basic training wear for Her Majesty's Army. First, they created the DH-82 Tiger Moth on October 1931, which the British Army used as an interwar biplane that was used to training their field soldiers on how to not only control, but to maneuver the aircraft using radio signals. Owing to the success of the DH-82 test, the aircraft company advanced and redeveloped it into a war-ready drone called the Queen Bee, cleverly suggesting a transformation into the final form of the moth, and rightly so. After all, the Queen Bee used the engines, undercarriage, tailplane, and other parts of a Tiger Moth. However, they made one minor tweak, one that would give the Queen Bee the ability to float if it were ever shot out of the air and landed in water. Hence, instead of using the Tiger Moth's fabric-covered metal frame fuselage, it used a wooden fuselage. Before the Second World War, the Queen Bee wasn't just idle. It was employed for practical anti-aircraft firing exercises in the mid-1930s. The intention was not to shoot the Queen Bee down. Instead, the trainers would aim off and the controller would attempt to recover such an aircraft for later use. In practice, the Queen Bee could be manned or unmanned quite akin to what Elon Musk has been planning with space travel. However, the drone retained a typical front cockpit for test flying and fairing, with its rear cockpit occupied by the robot gun. While the British's contribution to manned and unmanned combat aerial vehicles, otherwise called the UK, cannot be overstated, and their status as pioneers cannot be overruled, other nations have been throwing their hats in the ring and improving aerial warfare. In fact, in 1944, the cruise missile technology was initiated by the Germans during the dying embers of the Second World War with their V-1 flying bombs. These bombs, also known as buzz bombs or doodlebugs, used a gyroscopic guidance system to maintain course, as it wasn't capable of precision targeting at the time while being powered by a pulse jet engine, giving the buzzing sound that earned it the name buzz bomb. It was used to rain attacks on London in 1944 during the war. Other countries, including the United States, took a leaf from the English aerial warfare playbook and were obsessed with fatal aerial threats. During the Vietnam War, Uncle Sam created thousands of the AQM-34 Ryan Firebee drones, which were deployed to conduct surveillance missions. Over time, it became one of the very first unmanned aerial vehicles to be remotely controlled from a base. It became a staple of the United States defense and was used extensively for reconnaissance missions. However, the real turning point in aircraft development globally began in 2001 with the MQ-1 Predator. Although it was first deployed that year, the original design was conceived in the 1990s and commissioned into service in 1995. The creation of this drone had an instant impact on the future of aerial warfare. It was first deployed in 2001 by the Central Intelligence Agency, CIA, to carry out pinpoint strikes in Afghanistan. It was a never-seen-before phenomenon in war, where an unmanned aircraft could easily pick out a landmark in a vast geography without fail. In contrast, it was pretty reminiscent of the German V-1 flying bomb, the first cruise missile, except that it couldn't pinpoint locations. It used an accelerometer and motion sensor for movement, unlike the MQ-1 with a GPS. The former released its payload in a general location, not too far from its exact target, as it could only approximate its target. Still, the MQ-1s could find a need in a haystack 
and the blowing up of parts of Kandahar following the September 11 invasion in the United States is proof of that. The MQ-1 stands out for its use of real-time video surveillance, GPS navigation, and precision strike capabilities in a single platform, making it the first of its kind. It was the first drone to integrate all these characteristics seamlessly while translating its capabilities into war and excessive force, bolstering the United States' aerial threat. The success of the MQ-1 Predator laid the foundation for the rapid development and evolution of aerial warfare and unmanned aerial vehicles. As months turned into years, different versions of the MQ-1 Predators emerged. The MQ-1 was the primary unmanned aircraft used for war by the United States Air Force. It was modified to carry two AMG-114, otherwise known as Hellfire missiles. Since America tasted the power of having such military might, they focused on creating an even better version of the first. This new one was called the MQ-9 Reaper. The MQ-9 is much bigger, heavier, and more capable than the MQ-1 Predator. It was initially made for the USAF, which refers to these UAVs as remotely powered vehicles or remotely powered aircraft, emphasizing that they are ground controlled by some intelligent humans. The improved version of Reaper can carry at least 15 times more ordnance and can fly at a speed of almost three times that of MQ-1. All weapon employment operations in the aircraft are directed and supervised by air crews from the ground control station. The MQ-9 is the first hunter-killer UAV in the world that is optimized for long duration and high altitude reconnaissance. Describing the Reaper further, the U.S. Air Force Chief of Staff, General T. Michael Mosley, said in 2006 that while the UAV was mainly used for the ISR role during Operation Iraqi Freedom, the Reaper is a hunter-killer. This simply suggests that the drone isn't meant for just reconnaissance, fulfilling the hunter role, but also used to neutralize targets if need be. Before 2003, the Air Force and the Navy of the United States worked differently. While they both shared the same agenda, the security of the sovereign state, they had different ideas and approaches to getting things done. Initially, both parties had two unmanned combat air vehicle missions, the UKV and the UKVN. However, both programs merged, creating the Joint Unmanned Combat Air Systems, which DARPA monitors. Since JUCAS was a concerted effort from the Air Force and the Navy, they agreed on specifications for creating new aerial threats. They decided to bring on the Boeing X-45A and Northrop Grumman X-47A Pegasus. It is quite a surprise that DARPA, which is mainly responsible for providing the government with proof of concept, now oversees the actual development of military aircraft. However, they came up with the X-45B, a scaled-up X-45A, already considered the prototype of an operational variant that should enter the service in 2008, equipped with 1,590 kilograms of ordnance payload to a combat radius of 1,655 kilometers. Initially, they intended to build two, but before they could do so, the Air Force steered the project more efficiently with the X-45C. The organization JUCAS's goal has always been the same, to create a versatile combat network in which air and ground components are nodes that can be changed over time to support a wide range of potential missions. Hence, in the summer of 2003, North Grumman created a more advanced version of the X-47A Pegasus and named it the X-47B. This X-47B demonstrated the unmanned combat aerial vehicle's considerations for carrier-based operations, meaning that its launching and landing will be to and from an aircraft carrier in the middle of the ocean. On the carrier's flight deck, the X-47B is controlled by trained operators using a control display unit, otherwise called the CDU. The emergence of the X-47B has revolutionized both aerial and naval warfare. One of the most difficult times of war is losing people on your side. However, the emergence of the X-47B almost completely eradicates that. A deck operator on the aircraft carrier uses the control display unit to position the X-47B drone for takeoff and to park it after landing, meaning that it could be sent on a mission with the remote pilot staying on the deck, mitigating the risks of a potential loss of life should the aircraft be shot out of the air. It makes you wonder how many lives could have been saved in aerial warfare if this technology had existed long enough. While they prepare for takeoff from the deck of the aircraft carrier, the plane directors feed hand signals to the deck operator, which they follow to control the unmanned combat aerial vehicles, 
while preparing it for takeoff. While the unmanned combat aerial vehicles is set in motion, one of the directors signals them to stop. At the same time, a member of the gearing and arrest crew ensures that the X-47B's launch bar is hooked up correctly because if it isn't, the aircraft also cannot be ideally positioned underneath the catapult due to the wrong orientation of the unmanned combat aerial vehicles, which results, among other things, in a bad launch or damage to the aircraft. Once the launch bar is firmly attached, the plane director signals the safe status for the plane, and the unmanned combat aerial vehicles is placed in the final launch configuration. At this point, the force working on the catapult confirms by ensuring that all the connections and settings are correct for launching the aircraft. When the X-47B is ready for launch, the catapult officer, otherwise called a shooter, gives a signal, and the whole back bar is released. These aircraft were used in 2013 to perform initial unclassified carrier-based launches and landings of a relevant, low-observability UAS. Again, in aviation history, the X-47B in April 2015 demonstrated another success of the autonomous aerial refueling of an unmanned aircraft. Employing autonomous aerial refueling, this organization unleashed the best of what unmanned surveillance, strike, and reconnaissance systems are capable of regarding naval support. These previous demonstrations bring future unmanned air vehicles into reality and substantiate that the X-47B can perform standard missions, including aerial refueling, and can integrate and operate within any existing carrier air wing, just like a manned aircraft. The carrier air wing, or the CAW, refers to a group of aircraft launched from an aircraft carrier. Furthermore, the aircraft uses GPS, autopilot, and collision avoidance sensors to fly itself and land autonomously. As you can imagine, landing requires a precision approach, especially since the carrier is sailing away and the landing deck is angled. Once it touches down, its tail hook latches onto an arresting wire and the aircraft is brought to a stop. The control display unit sends a signal to the onboard computer in the unmanned combat aerial vehicles, communicating with the artificial intelligence to carry out its next move. Aside from saving lives, one of the X-47B's most outstanding merits would be how cost-effective it is for the Air Force, the Navy, and, by extension, the country. Since it can operate from aircraft carriers, it does not need permission from a country to operate from its runways. As expected, questions arose on the proposed cooling system for the X-47Bs. However, it has been rightly controlled with an internally coated cooling system using an S-shaped exhaust system to reduce the infrared signature. The X-47B is quite heavy duty as it is built with the capacity to fly with a maximum takeoff weight of 44,501 and an inbuilt range of 2,400 miles. Hence, its auto-refueling program isn't as challenging to achieve as first feared. Auto-refueling is done using an Omega tanker built by Omega Aerial Refueling Services. On April 22, 2015, the United States Navy told the media that one of Omega's KC-707s refueled a Northrop Grumman X-47B in flight, selling it as the first time that an unmanned aerial vehicle had been refueled in flight. While the British had their heydays when they beat everyone to the punch by building the very first drones, including the aerial target, the Tiger Moth DH.80-2, and the Queen Bee, the United States remains the leader in developing operational carrier-based unmanned combat aerial vehicles, with X-47B leading the charge in subsequent efforts, like the MQ-25 joining in. Uncle Sam's success with carrier-based operations seems to have ruffled a few feathers in Europe and Asia with countries like China, Russia, Japan, France, and the United Kingdom aiming to recreate this phenomenon. China created its unmanned combat aerial vehicle prototype in 2013 and called it the Sharp Sword. The Shenyang Aircraft Design Institute developed it in collaboration with the Hogdu Aviation Industry Group. At the same time, the Aviation Industry Corporation of China provided them with seven different models to choose from, they wanted a more stealth-focused approach. It is quite imaginable how devastating it can be to be in enemy airways and somehow manage to stay undiscovered for quite a while. The People's Republic wanted a version of its own X-47B capable of both reconnaissance and strike operations. To suit the stealth parameters, the GJ-11 Sharp Sword was created with a tailless flying wing, meaning the aircraft has no definite fuselage. Its crew, 
payload, fuel, and equipment are housed inside the main wing structure. A flying wing may have various small protuberances, such as pods, nacelles, blisters, booms, or vertical stabilizers, which is a far cry from the United States' X-47B design. The aircraft is designed with other stealth features, including shaping the rear airframe around the engine exhaust and serrated weapon bay doors. It boasts a wingspan of only 14 meters. Although the prototypes seem promising in the tested early versions, they still had improvements to make, and they knew it too. Hence, they kept the development in progress and unveiled the GJ-11 Sharp Sword again in 2019 during the National Day Parade held on October 1st. On that day, the People's Republic of China debuted several systems, including some unmanned aerial vehicles and, more importantly, the unmanned combat aerial vehicle. As suspected, it would be that the United States' recent developments have sparked a global arms race, with every top nation rushing for a seat at the top of the pile. During the parade, China debuted their medium-altitude long-endurance drones, otherwise called the mail drones. These drones are one of China's most outstanding military achievements as they compete directly with some of America's renowned drones, with unmanned aerial vehicles such as the MQ-1 and MQ-9 Reaper coming to mind. The Chinese version has a service ceiling of below 9,000 meters and is capable of flying at a relatively long endurance stretch of up to 24 hours or longer in some cases. They are called the GJ-1 and GJ-2. EO turrets and the capability to fire small air-to-ground missiles, specifically the KD-9-10 laser-guided anti-tank missile family, are features shared by the GJ-1 and GJ-2. Just like the MQ-1 and MQ-9 Reaper, the GJ-1 and GJ-2 are considerably different in size, with the latter being the heavy-duty one. Being a larger aircraft, the JJ-2 is able to carry a larger payload and is also equipped with a chin-mounted synthetic aperture radar to enhance target acquisition for the strike option further. Therefore, they can be considered the People's Liberation Army's equivalents of the MQ-1s and the MQ-9s. While no one can really tell how many JJ-1s and JJ-2s are in service, the number is certainly much lower than the medium-altitude long-endurance drones available in the United States. However, their carrier-based operation version, the GJ-11 Stealthy Unmanned Combat Aerial Vehicles, was unveiled in the same year. Still, it is quite a shock that not a single picture was released during its development period, even after the prototype was flown in 2013. While it was on display, it was pretty noticeable that it was a simple static mock-up of the real deal, leaving everyone none the wiser about the development or plans for the GJ-11. In October 2021, AVIC showcased the JJ-11 at Airshow China. The drone is reportedly capable of taking off autonomously from Type 076 amphibious assault ships, a type of warship employed to land and support ground forces on enemy territory during an armed conflict. The design evolved from aircraft carriers converted for use as helicopter carriers. In such ways, it remains pretty speculative if the JJ-11 Sharp Sword is capable of carrier-based operation. Other European countries, like France, are also in an arms race to catch up with the United States' cutting-edge technology, with the 2021 leading the way. However, as of this moment, only the United States can prove beyond reasonable doubt that it has a fully functional carrier-based drone. Thanks for watching. While you are still here, click on the link on your screen to check out another of our videos. See you there.